Welcome to USIP ICIP, a weekly podcast with Northern Lights Winery founder Doug Bell, exploring the experiences from leaders in business, social media, and family. Now here's this week's exceptional guest. Welcome in. This is USIP ICIP. My name's Doug Bell. I'm the uh, podcast host here. I'm joined by Jen Keim from Purple Moose Portraits. You're the photographer and the owner of the company. Um, and uh, I'm really excited that you came in today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So we're drinking Bumbleberry, which is the blueberry raspberry Saskatoon wine. Nice, light and refreshing fall wine. I'm actually going to be making mulled wine out of this later on uh, because, you know, it's getting a little more chilly now. And uh, we've had such an exceptional summer that I haven't been thinking about, you know, anything hot for a long time, but today I am. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, with, hopefully this isn't a heated discussion. I'm really looking forward to diving into your past and learning more about you. So uh, without further ado, maybe uh, you could give us a little bit of an update on where you came from and, and where you grew up. Sounds good. So I'm mostly from Prince George, moved here when I was quite young. Um, and then, you know, when I was a teenager, I thought that I had to move away from Prince George and didn't appreciate everything that was here and traveled around a little bit, moved in a couple of different places, but I always came back. Um, yeah, I just, I really, the city has a lot to offer. You know, you have the shopping, you have a hospital close by, you can go hiking. There's so many lakes and everything nearby. It's just awesome. And the community aspect, once I started a business, I really noticed like how we support each other. It's really beautiful. It's very true. Prince George is such a warm and welcoming community and it's a, it's a nice place to grow up and raise a family. And a lot of people do leave and then come back. That's definitely true. Um, was there anything in your childhood that drew you to the artistic elements of photography? Well, I've always been really into drawing and stuff when I was little. And then once my mom got a camera, I was like photographing everything, like all the little flowers and landscape stuff. And that, I always wanted to photograph people, but I was terrified to actually photograph people and talk to people and try and put myself out there. So I started uh, when we moved back up to Prince George uh, to help out my um, in-laws that owned Rogers Meats. I decided that on my walks, I'd bring my camera and I would just try and photograph people I saw on the street just to build up that confidence. And one day it was minus 30. I was walking to the bus stop and I see this old man sitting outside and he's got a blue jacket on and he's got a beard, white beard, white hair, and he's smoking a cigarette and there's ice in it because it's minus 30. And he's got these icy blue eyes. And I look at him like, that would be a really interesting person to photograph. And I walk right by. <laughs> so then I turn around and I, I hold myself accountable and I go up to him and I ask if I can take his portrait. And he was very gracious and allowed me to. And when I show him the back of the camera, he said, I am so proud of you for capturing true human beauty. And that's when I was like, okay, no, I got to do this. It's, it's interesting that you had this fear, right? And be, behind the camera, a lot of people are, are afraid of being in front of the camera. But you were uh, a little bit afraid of being behind the camera. What what do you think was driving those emotions? I think, you know, I just didn't have the self-confidence to put yourself out there, right? When you're photographing a landscape or animals, there you're not putting yourself out there in the same way when you're just doing it casually. But once you start wanting to photograph people and making a business out of it, you're you're really putting yourself out there to be critiqued in all ways, in all aspects. And um, I wasn't sure how much people would accept me for me and be able to connect with me to have their portraits done. And what was it about people that drew you to that type of photography? Because there's, I mean, just like anything, photography, there's a million different kind of niches you can be in. And some people are generalists, of course. Um, but but that particular type of photographer, you were photography you were really drawn to. Yes, portraits specifically. So I don't really shoot events and I shoot pe people's pets and stuff because it's fun. But I really love portraits. And there's just something intimate and being able to make space for a person to truly see themselves in the best light. So whether that is just with the hair and makeup or best lighting, wardrobe posing, or even a little bit of Photoshop, because nobody wants a double chin. Um, I really want people to be able to see a portrait of themselves so that they can feast their life upon. And you have been doing this for quite a long time, but kind of coming back to that area, um, what role do you think like social media has played in terms of people um, their, and their interest in photography in general, as well as in taking photos of themselves and others. I see it both ways. So some ways people take lots of photos of themselves and they're totally fine with it. But I find a lot of my clients come to me because they don't like having their portraits done. So when they are taking photos of themselves, it's with huge amount of filters or not photos at all. 
and they'll take mm-hmm. photos of everything else, but like they don't like their photos done. And so that's really the clients I accept. Um, yeah, and as for people being interested in photography, I think cell phones are amazing. People are always like, what kind of camera should I get? I'm like, well, unless you're printing beyond a 16 by 20, just use your phone. Mm-hmm. They're so good right now. All of a sudden you're traveling, you have your phone on you anyway. So fly at her. They're amazing now. Yeah, I, I remember growing up and traveling and, and this was before, you know, cell phones had such great cameras. I don't even think they had cameras at this time. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and bringing this thing around and now, you know, your phone, your internet, your computer, everything's attached to this. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, uh, experienced when I was starting to grow my business and people would come to me for advice sometimes was a little bit of imposter syndrome as well. Um, I, I imagine it's really difficult when you're getting into like artistic elements like photography, because a lot of the the worth you you are derived from is either based on your own sense of self worth or um, feedback that you get from people, but a lot of times that that can't necessarily be accurate, right? Because it is such a personal thing, and and everybody has a different opinion on what what is great art and what isn't. Uh, how how do you kind of uh, how did you initially in the early days kind of drive yourself past that? Well, you know, as business owner, imposter syndrome is always kind of there, isn't it? Um, but in the early days, I got really great advice and you work off an average. So you're never too high or too low. You are an average and whatever your average is, is basically the kind of clients you're attracting and your self-worth is what you're going to attract for clients. Mm -hmm. So as your self-worth gets better, you're going to attract more people that value your art, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and it's always a little bit of, um, a balance of having your own perception of yourself, because if you're not your own biggest supporter, no one else will be. Also understanding that uh, that the feedback you're getting is just affirmation that you are doing a good job, right? So that we don't get disillusioned if, I mean, for instance, if I was a photographer, I would never have any paying customers because I'm not very good. I'm all about quantity over quality. Um, yet, you know, even I get lucky sometimes and, and somebody sees something that I've done and, and can actually, uh, move uh, towards that artistic element. Um, speaking of, of that and, and kind of during your years of growing up, uh, do you remember your first camera and your first time behind the lens and what was that experience like? I do. So I was probably... 10 and I had do you remember those film cameras they were like kind of round with this bulky film case that was my first camera that was just mine I didn't have to share it with anybody it was my camera and um yeah I would photograph everything and they were all horrible (laughs) absolutely horrible did you develop the film oh yeah of course Mm -hmm. yeah so I went through lots of film (laughs) and did uh, do you still have those photos yes I do tucked away yeah yeah it's the photos of my pony photos of family and like yeah, just little things, but I mostly keep the ones of friends and family. And were you always interested in cameras from that point forward? Or did you go through any periods where you maybe put the camera down and tried to start something else? I definitely was always interested in it, but it's funny you say that. So I went a year without internet, without a fancy phone, and I tried really hard not to take photos of anything and just to try and see where I wanted to go in life and remove all of the distraction. And it really made me realize that having a f- camera on you all the time really distracts from just enjoying the moment. So I try actually not to have my camera on me all the time anymore. I try not to, I try and limit that. And if I wanna go out and photograph, say artistic elements of like nature or anything on location, I try and make that a uh, purposeful decision. And during that period where you were kind of developing out your own sense of what you wanted to do, uh, were there other things or did you, was it always photography? Oh, I thought I would be a vet, a tattoo artist, you know, everybody has like their range. Um, but I didn't get serious about photography until uh, I moved back to Prince George with my ex-husband. And that's really when I was like, I got to do something. And do you remember your first paying customer? I do. So, yeah, I was amazed. I started my business. Um different than a lot of photographers do. I started at a paying wage. So I didn't start with dirt poor, uh, where you do 
dollars for like 50 photographs. Um, I started off where I studied for two years prior to opening my studio. And then I opened it and charged $150 a photograph. And when I got that, that somebody valued that, I was amazed. It was like, okay, I can actually do this. You know, I, I have the skills and I can do this. So, mm -hmm. and I look at my photography then from now and it's just like, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate how you've kind of honed your craft and there are so many different ways to create a business, right? And to create value for yourself. And one of the ways is to just get in it and start doing it and learn. And, and I think in, in the career of photography in particular, so many people get it there in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Some people are just passionate about photography. They just learn by doing over time. Of course, there is a scientific component about photography, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding like angles and backgrounds and spectrums and, and all these things I don't know the words of. Uh, and, and then of course, there's an artistic component of it. Um, do you consider yourself more of an artistic photographer or do you consider yourself more of like a technical photographer? Definitely more artistic. Um, I don't focus a lot on the gear. I don't focus a lot on that aspect. And when I work with my clients, I always say that we're working together. So they come to me with ideas and we have ideas and we, and we bring it together and create art. And I don't worry so much about the technical aspect. You know, I move the lights around until it looks good. I don't, there's, you can do light meter and there's ratios and everything you can use to figure it out, but I'm definitely more the hands-on move things around and mm -hmm. yeah. And, and probably at home as well, I imagine that like your career follows you around. So how has it affected your home life? Well, I have two little kids now, mm -hmm. so I try not to photograph them at every moment. Um, but it's funny, my young, my oldest used to come to the studio with me. So even now when he like comes to the studio, he'll like try and fix a backdrop or move a light around. And he asks if he can come to the studio. And I let him hold my camera with a strap on, of course. <laughs> and he takes pictures and he takes pictures with my phone. And uh, he'll even like back up and like be like, oh no, I gotta get the right angle and stuff. And he's four, so. <laughs> That's amazing. He probably really, you know, he wants to be like mama and he wants to kind of engage with this. But it probably is really fun when you have something that you can do at the age of four with your kids that also happens to be your career. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How do you try? How do you approach that balance of like, you know, this is now not just a passion. This is a job as well. How do, how do you do that with your family? Well, it's a balancing act, you know, and you're trying to constantly figure it out. I mean, when the kids are sick, you're working more at night, right? So uh, I try and limit my work hours actually to 10 to 4 so that I can spend my mornings with the kids and then I can spend the evenings with them before bed, you know, and then I'm usually up to like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning working. So, uh, yeah, I try and really hard to not be on my phone and make conscious efforts to set work at work and family with family. Now, it's really important to you in terms of acceptance of like yourself and your body. Mm -hmm. And when you're working with clients and, and uh, developing out their confidence to do the same, how, how do you do this? How do you approach it? The most important thing is the consultation. Yeah. So do complimentary consultations because I want everybody to be able to come see the experience that they can have, whether they book me or not. And it's just about making space for people. You know, we don't just do a consultation talking about the products and the photography and how long it's going to take. It's usually not 15 minutes. It's usually an hour. And we talk about everything from body issues, where they are in life, style, what they want to represent of themselves. And I'd say that's why I go towards more the artistic aspect is because it's more about bringing out this person and who they are and who they want to be. Mm -hmm. And once you create space for people, then just everything else happens. And how do you, how do they do this though without you? Because not, not saying uh, maybe they don't live in the city of Prince George, maybe they can't get your services. How would you focus on, uh, how would you focus if you were them trying to do the same thing? If you're trying to like, so somebody trying to start a photography business or somebody trying to build their self-worth. I'm really thinking about self-worth. I mean, cause that's, that's the, that's the critical component. Like everyone can start a photography business, but not everyone can like heal the amazing uh, emotional damages in, that we have in society. And that's kind of what you're doing in a way. Yeah, uh, at least I hope so. <laughs> uh, the main thing is just, you know, you got to look into yourself and give yourself a lot of grace. Uh, forgive yourself. 
is a big thing, right? Everybody, we have so many pressures and once we feel those pressures, we are hard on ourselves that we even feel those pressures. So it's about giving yourself grace and forgiveness and really taking the time to look at yourself and work on yourself. I mean, self-development is a lot of work and it's one of those things where it's not, you're just not seeing building blocks. It's all internal. So people might not see what you're doing and you just gotta keep at it. Even on the hard days when you wanna cry in a mirror, you still just, you know, keep at it one foot in front of the other. When you're talking to your clients, you're almost a little bit of a, like you're helping them out emotionally as well as, as, as um, you know, with their photography needs. But really you're, you're trying to help them project a person they want to be in a lot of ways, right? You talk about uh, portraits. Portraits are uh, a snapshot of a moment in time um, that people can then look at and say, this is me at this age. And you can see my confidence protruding, or you can see how my family looks and, you know, in this way, or, um, and, uh, to some degree, uh, there's a little bit of, I don't want to say fakeness in it, but it's like, it's, you're kind of, um, portraying where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that allows them the confidence to get there. Is that true? Yeah. Well, it depends on the person. So there's, I love portraiture because it's really intimate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's about just where you are in life. I have a friend and he said it was a photograph of his depression. I have other friends who've gone through cancer and I photographed that. And it's not really about moving forward. It's about an acceptance of where they are. And from that, they're able to just give themselves some peace mm -hmm. and move forward eventually. But it's the photograph itself isn't really a, a step forward. It's about that current point in time. So you're focusing on a state of vulnerability in your photography as well as, you know, the highlight, the Instagram reel of the life that we call it. How do you showcase that in photography? How do you uh, represent the client appropriately so that they feel good about it, but also that you're being real? So it really comes down to the consultation. So during the consultation, you know, we talk about what they want to represent and where they are in life. And then that's when I usually pitch my ideas. So they know ahead of time. It's not like they're being surprised during the photography that that's what's going on. Um, and sometimes just a real moment comes up and then I ask them if I can photograph it. And sometimes, you know, it's just about getting people to talk and throw them off guard or just being quiet and making space. And it really just depends. And, you know, I'm always asking people, do you want to be photographed nude or not? Because that's a whole other sense of vulnerability. And oftentimes like the nudes aren't what you'd think of as beautiful. It's usually more a sense of vulnerability and, sh and showcasing that or showcasing the strength. Yeah, I just, make, making space is the biggest thing. And do you, so obviously you do that with a variety of settings and with the client. Um, and are there tricks that you do within the photography itself in terms of whether that's like during the photography, lighting, background settings, or after the photography being in like editing, to try and highlight specific emotions or, or portions of that event. As you, it could be a good combination of both. So say I'm planning to do a photograph of that. So like uh, my friend who was over cancer, we knew that what we were photographing. So I set it up that way. And then I always bring stuff into Photoshop and emphasize highlights or lowlights and things like that. But sometimes, you know, a real moment happens and it's not like a set for it. Um, and then I'll go into Photoshop and I'll edit that further and, in different ways. As you started to develop your business, how did you approach it? And how were those first few clients? How did you get them? In? So I started off by having uh, gift certificates and I gave away a free makeover and one photo. And I gave those out like crazy. <laughs> and most people ended up purchasing extras on top of that. And that's really what kickstarted my business. And I'd recommend that to anybody because you're charging the price point that you need to be charging. And people get something out of it at the same time. So it's kind of a win-win. And how many people do you photograph a year? Well, I'm just getting back into it. So I've had two car crashes in the last two years and then two children. So <laughs> it's been busy. So I'm just getting back into it. And I only take on for full sessions, like those custom sessions, I only take on three a month mm -hmm. because then it's a lot of uh, front work in the planning. It's a lot of back work and the editing and printing and orders and everything else like that. So I only take three of those a month. 
Um, and then I do headshots and like little pop-ins here and stuff that I call express sessions. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and But not a lot. I don't like to overwhelm it because then I feel like you forgo the client experience. But how would you, would you want to grow your business? I mean, you are your business in a lot of ways. Um, how do you kind of represent what you, where you want to go with where you are right now? Yeah. So where I want to go is I want to start offering like mini moose is what I've started to come up with. Mm -hmm. And so that's doing like express sessions so that people can have access to the skill level I have with the lighting and everything. Um, and have a chance to get a good portrait because I know not everybody can afford my custom sessions. And so for those mini sessions, I'm looking at training a photographer and growing in that realm. Um, as for the custom sessions, uh, that'll always be me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they are buying you if they're buying that. And that's why they're willing to pay money because they know the quality of your work. Um, but I also imagine that, uh, that sometimes demand can be too high, right? And so uh, how, how do you deal with that? And just book them further down. Yeah. This next time, six months in advance or whatever. Um, what do you think that the common misconceptions are about your industry and your career? And uh, and how do, how do we change those? Uh, well, as artists, I feel like they're very undervalued. You know, everyone's a lot of, I wouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people are used to paying a lower amount for photography. It's not something that they really realize how much work goes into it. It's maybe 7% photography and everything else takes over. So people say, you have a great camera or it only took you like 10 seconds to take this photo. Why does it cost $275? But it's like all that skill you've learned to make it last, only take that long um, and be able to connect with people and stuff. And yeah, there's a lot of back work that goes into it. So I really hope that my fellow photographers will raise their prices because the rising tide raises all ships. And artists in general, I feel, need to value themselves more and uh, stop taking in what everyone else tells them. That makes a lot of sense. But also understanding that um, that this industry in general is just changing so much, right? Uh, and I think with the advent of social media, um, you know, in particular, Instagram really, uh, and, and the iPhone in a lot of ways, um, brought forward a lot of people who, who feel like they can do photography. Yeah. Do, do you think that there is more supply out there than there needs to be? Or like, is there a way to, um, for customers to feel the confidence that they're going to get the best quality product out of it? Um, because there is so many options. That's why I say always meet your photographer, always go for a consultation and connect with your photographer and see their work. And you need to love your photographer to have good portraits. If you don't love your photographer, you're not going to like your portraits. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much as simple as that. So, yeah, I mean, lots of people can do this business. And I mean, if you have a good phone and you're only doing small photos, then fly at her if you're good at it. And if people want your work, that speaks enough, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, if you connect with your photographer because there are so many options out there. And a lot of people who start off not charging their worth burn out. Do you have any funny stories of some other shoots that you've done that maybe things went a little haywire off the rails? Maybe they didn't go the way you expected? Oh, the hardest photo shoot I ever did was, uh, I can say this because they're family, uh, it was a, a deaf beagle, senior beagle, and a toddler oh, in no. studio. So it's not like you could get like nice background of them wandering around together with like fall leaves or summer leaves. It was in studio wandering around and like trying to get this deaf dog to like come over. Yeah, that was awful. Learned a lot from that. <laughs> I can imagine. I try and get a toddler or a dog to look in one direction, let alone that. Must deaf dog. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. blind, if they can hear you, you can at least clap and they'll kind of look your direction. But like deaf, you're just on your own. <laughs> do you have like uh, a vision of like a shoot you would love to do one day that you haven't had an opportunity to do yet? Yes, definitely. I have this. So there's these parachute dresses that I rent from the States that are hand dyed. And I'd love to do one in fall with the fall leaves and the yellow gown and just make something really ethereal like that. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really cool. And then otherwise, I really would love to just do more simple portraits of people. Nothing fancy, nothing super stylized, just simple portraits. Where did the name Purple Moose 
portraits come from. Yeah, it's kind of a funky name, hey? (laughs) So, um, way back when, um, on DeviantArt, uh, I was Canadian rocker. And so I always wanted to stick with, like, something Canadian. So I went with purple because it's the color royalty. And when you're with me, I want you to just be seen, heard, and respected. I want you to feel valued in your session. So that's why purple. Moose because it's Canadian and also we all feel really awkward in front of a camera and like we think of a moose as this kind of like bulky awkward thing uh, but they're also uh, very strong good mothers and like respected animals right and then porches because that's all I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had any pushback from that? Of course. <laughs> How do you deal with that? Uh, well, it was mostly from the photography community when I was starting and there are uh, a lot of Americans thought that the moose looked like a thong (laughs) and everybody in the like industry usually use their name or they're like some like tree images or something like that. Um, not a lot of people got the purple moose thing. They said it wouldn't work for me and Mm. everything else. So, uh, no, I just stuck with it. I felt like I, I wanted to stand out. I wanted something different. And I my name's Jennifer. So, like, there's a lot of Jennifers out there. <laughs> it is very true. Yeah, my wife's name is Jennifer as well. And uh, But uh, even with, like, the portraits, like, that's a very narrow niche. And uh, there are other people that do just portraits. But um, uh, have you do you find that your clients uh, enjoy the services from you with one thing and want you to branch out and do more? Yeah, so like sometimes people ask me for weddings and I usually like sometimes I'll second shoot for people for events or weddings and things like that. Um, And I enjoy it and I'm good at it. Uh, For weddings, I usually tell people that they want to hire someone else for the like ceremony or event part. But like if it comes to like the family photos and bride and groom photos and first look or they want to do a session before or after, that's a little bit more risky um, as a bride and groom because I find like we're missing a lot of that. Uh, I, I try and get them towards that end and less of hiring me for events, but you know, I still shoot. If somebody really wants me to photograph their newborn baby, I usually just say that mom's got to be in it and then I'll do it. But, (laughs) uh, yeah. So, but otherwise, yeah, I usually just refer them to someone else. We have great photographers in the area. And how have you focused yourself, um, within the industry, like in terms of the community, are you trying to lead the community? Are you trying to kind of build the the relationships? Um, it sounds like you already are, you know, spending time talking to them about, you know, your vision for photography in the future. Yeah. So definitely when I first started out, I was networking everywhere and telling everybody. So now that I'm getting back into it, I really want to start to build a photography community again. Um, I have a studio downtown, so I really want to, now that COVID's kind of relaxed, have everybody over for like creative nights and just, you know, connect. And like I said, a rising tide raises all ships and we can all learn something from each other. Is there a great place for aspirational photographers to go both for resources and connecting with with other people in the community? Oh, for sure. I mean, with Facebook now, it's really become accessible. So uh, I got my start on Creative Live, uh, whereas I started to really delve into information. And But there's like, so if you want to do headshots, there's Peter Hurley has a whole group. Uh, if you want to do contemporary portraits like I do, there's the Sue Bryce community. Um, for newborns, I recommend the Jewel community. Those are all like world-leading photographers. And Lindsay Adler for fashion, Brooke Shaden for self-portraits. There's... Lots out there. Who are some of the mentors and the people that you look up to that you're trying to to strive to get closer to? So I did have a lot of mentors in the start. And um, like the Sue Bryce community was really huge for me. There's some really great people in there. Um, and then just casual conversation with people in town, uh, like with Bobby Carpino. She was awesome to talk to. I mean, she had a photography studio in town forever. Um, and then I love whenever I get a chance to talk with Emily Jane photography, she's lovely. Um, yeah. And other than that, I had a really great mentor when I first started through Futurepreneur, um, Renata with, uh, Northern Development Initiative. She was amazing to talk to. So I really valued everything she taught me and definitely still implement it. And going through the path of education like you did, or going through the path of experience and just repetition, like a lot of other people do. Um, Where do you recommend people start? Well, you definitely need somewhere to learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can try and do it yourself. Um, You're going to 
spend a lot of time when you could have learned it much quicker and so much more accessible. I mean, you don't have to travel to workshops anymore. You can do it from your home and you don't have to buy thousand dollar packages anymore. You can get a lot for free on YouTube. You can get a lot for $40. So I really recommend people search out some education instead of just trying to do the hard road. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that you are getting your, 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 your popular already, but you know, you're getting back into the industry. Um, where do you see purple moose portraits going in the future? Oh, I'd really love if it just kind of stayed where it's at, where I have the three to four clients a month, um, to really service and give my all to, uh, and just being able to provide that experience to more people and having more people see themselves in a positive light and being able to love themselves. Well, those are all some very great lessons. And uh, I think you've actually taught us a lot today. So I really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, Jen Kaim, Purple Moose Portraits, we're going to share your social media platforms uh, on the show notes below. Highly recommend people check you out, uh, learn a little bit more about what you're doing. And if they uh, are in need of the services, make sure you reach out to her. Also, just for education and awareness, I think it'd be really fun. Um, this is Doug Bell. It's been USIP, ISIP. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this week. And Jen, thank you for coming in. Until next time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to You Sip, I Sip. Please hit the five-star rating and leave us a review. If you'd like to learn more about Northern Lights Winery, text us at 604-670-4046 or visit us on social media at Northern Lights Winery.